Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us again for our Wednesday afternoon Bible class. Today we are talking about um, blood in the Old Testament and the New Testament and the significance that it has there. Um, I think Rick's going to start off this morning with some reading. This afternoon, I will. This morning's already passed. Already gone. So uh, <laughs> they didn't want to confuse our, our viewers. Um, obviously, God places a lot of value um, on blood like he did water uh, in our in our last two sessions when we talked about the importance of uh, blood in the old testament and new i mean water in the old testament and new testament um and uh in case you hadn't had a chance to do the preparatory reading i just wanted to read a few passages probably not more than uh, 20 verses all, all told um uh, some in leviticus and some in, in hebrews um in leviticus uh, chapter 17 verse 11 it makes a, a general uh, uh, overview statement, which is was true back then, and it's true now, and it's true in, in uh, as far as I know, just about every uh, animal in the kingdom that has blood uh, in it. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. So as God uh, sets up his law uh, with Moses and the children of Israel, um, he, he establishes this idea that atoning for our sins, atoning for our souls, um, is connected to blood. Not necessarily ours, but that of animals that were sacrificed. And we'll talk uh, in, in the lesson, and we've talked in prior lessons about how uh, this was not a new concept with uh, Moses and the children of Israel. Apparently, God had required the sacrifice of animals going all the way back to uh, shortly after the time Adam and Eve uh, left the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> and even in an earlier lesson, we talked about the notion that someone said the first animal uh, blood sacrifice was the one that God himself uh, committed when, when he made skins uh, for Adam and Eve due to their nakedness that they had now uh, exposed to themselves and their awareness of knowledge of good and evil. So uh, this is nothing new in, in the law of the Israelites. There's another passage uh, a few verses over that says in verse 14, For as for the life of all flesh is in the blood, is identified with its life, therefore I said to the sons of Israel, you are not to eat the blood of any flesh, for the flesh, for the life of all flesh is in its blood, and whoever eats it shall be cut off. So that was just one, and there were numerous um, prohibitions uh, that concerned uh, things they could and could not eat, and and uh, different types of animals and so forth. But one of the things uh, that he forbade was uh, eating the blood of, of any flesh. Uh, in, in, uh, for, for those individuals at that time. Um, in, in Hebrews, uh, the ninth chapter, flip over several books, we know and we have said that the book of Hebrews uh, is our, it's almost like a, a line of demarcation. It, it is a, a separator between that which was and that which is. That which was under the old law and that which is under uh, under Christ, and we have a lot of comparisons and contrasts um, in the book of Hebrews, and we, due to our study of types, we have referred to the book of Hebrews uh, a number of times because it does contrast and show the inferiority of the type with that which now we find uh, in Christ uh, himself, his life, his body, his sacrifice, his covenant, uh, his law and and all all of that in Hebrews the ninth chapter uh, I'm just going to uh, skip through and and hit a few verses verses six and seven now when these things have been thus prepared the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle performing the divine worship but into the second only the high priest enters once a year not without taking blood which means he did take blood which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. 
This is talking about the, the sacrifices that were made uh, uh, once a year by the high priest going into uh, the inner part there of the, of the temple and, and making the sacrifice there uh, on his behalf and on behalf of the people. Uh, verses, uh, verse 9. going along with this idea, which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. As we have said under the old law, sins were not forgiven. Now, the forgiveness of sins is talked about and is uh, related to their sacrifices, but we all know that the forgiveness of sins for all of mankind did not come until uh, later on when Christ offered himself. And uh, if you want a good verse for that, it's not one that we're going to read here. Oh, yes, it is. Um, is verse 15. As we get to verse 15, we're not going to pause and pull it apart, but verse 15 here in Hebrews 9 talks about this notion of what we have labeled the blood of Christ flows in both directions. If Christ's coming, forgave the sins of the people living at that time, that would have been tremendous. But we know that anyone who follows him after the shedding of his blood also can avail themselves of the forgiveness of their sins through repentance, through baptism, through confession, and all those things that we talked about uh, last week. So the question is, what about those people who don't have a chance to uh, be obedient to the gospel of Christ? Well, verse 15. Okay, we're going to go ahead and talk about 15 here because this is an interesting concept. It says, and for this reason, he is the mediator. He, Christ, is a mediator of a new covenant. He, he is the author of that. He is the reason it exists in order that since a death has taken place is for the redemption of the transgressions, not at that time, not in the future, that were committed under the first covenant. Those who have been called may receive the promise of the internal, eternal inheritance. So his blood was shed not only for those at that, that time, for those in the future, but as verse 15 says, for those that were committed under the uh, first covenant, those who were found faithful under the old law or whatever law. Even the patriarchal uh, dispensation had apparent expectations that God had of his people. And if people strove to and complied with and pleased God with their uh, behavior um, and offered whatever sacrifices uh, he, he required of them, uh, then Christ's blood goes back and covers all of those people as well. So... I'm going to just read through that when we get to 15. So I'm going to read verses um, 8, uh, 11 to 15. So the priests did their thing. And then it says, but in 11, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle. Didn't go into the tabernacle of old. He entered in the one that was not made with hands. That is to say, not of this creation and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once, one time, for everyone having obtained eternal redemption. And there's that once for all or once for everyone notion that is mentioned there in 12 as well. For if the blood of of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh if that was how they got taken care of back then verse 14 how much more we're talking about comparisons here the type is inferior to that which follows how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Rhetorical question saying a lot more. And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant in order that since a death has taken place for the redemption 
of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Four, where a covenant is, there must be of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it is never enforced while the one who made it lives. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. And then 22 to 28. And according to the law, one, makes, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So that's why we are studying blood. There is, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And why is that? Because God has set it up that way. That's the only reason that that is. There's nothing miraculous about blood. In the same way, there's nothing miraculous about the water in which we are baptized. Except the fact that we are, we are rendering obedience to God because he has set it up this way. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies, and that, there's our word, I think, tupos, um, as a type, of things in the of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, like the priest did, a mere copy of the true, which is heaven, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he should offer himself often, the way they continually had to offer sacrifices. As the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood not his own, otherwise he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes the judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, shall appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to hint to those who eagerly await. That takes care of chapter 9. And now we have some verses in chapter 10 as well. Verse 1 through 4. For the law, the old law, since it has only a shadow, and there's our our word for uh, type, again, a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things can never, by the same sacrifices year by year, which they offer continually, make perfect those who draw near. The Old Testament sacrifices were not for the purification of the people. No one was purified or uh, totally forgiven or cleansed totally until Christ offered himself on the cross. So there must have been another reason for those sacrifices. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had uh, consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, and here's the purpose, is a reminder of the sins year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Verse 4. You can't do that with animals. If God had set it up that way to do that, fine. But God is telling us right here, the blood of bulls and goats were for a time period, were for a reminder, were for those people under those laws, patriarchal Moses, whatever the situation was, so that they could satisfy God remind themselves of their sins and hope for uh, the fact that their obedience would one day be reckoned to them as righteousness. Verse 11. And every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, Christ, having, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all all time sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. 
Verse 18. Now, where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. Once Christ did that, no other sin, no other sacrifice needed to be made. No other uh, sacrifice was forthcoming. No other son of God would be leaving heaven and coming to this earth. And then the last 19 to 24. Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus and by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. So, <coughs> with that, we have uh, a lot about blood and we have a lot uh, about sacrifices um, our lesson starts out by reminding us that we have talked about uh, blood in previous uh, previous lessons lesson 15 talked about uh, the blood sacrifices uh, connecting us that sacrifice to man's acknowledgement of his sins we talked about that then in lesson 5 for Abel's sacrifice uh, through that examination we were due, uh, we determined that that uh, Abel's office offering was acceptable and Cain's was not. Blood is a synonym or metaphor for life itself, Genesis 4.10. Both lessons, um, and, and Genesis 4.10 is the point where it says, uh, Abel's blood cries out to me from the earth. So, uh, even though Abel at that point was dead, God was telling Cain his blood is still, uh, since it was related to his life and since you have taken his life, his blood cries out to me. Um, more than likely for vengeance, uh, for revenge. Both lessons uh, looked at these blood offerings within those contexts. Um, so, we want to go behind the scenes a little bit with this and a little bit more depth. Um, talk about the nature of blood, its connection to life. Um, and why God might have chosen uh, that entity um, that allows man uh, forgiveness of his sins. Hey, your mic up. I've never had to do that before. <laughs> Maybe I'm just a little bit more soft-spoken than normal. <laughs> I doubt that. Um, and as we said, as we say in the in, toward the end of that uh, introductory uh, paragraph there. Uh, the book of Hebrews, as we just read, talks about the copy or the shadow um, of the Old Testament, that which was set up so that we could learn about and understand God and his relationship to sacrifices and the blood of animals there, and then coming over into the New Testament where the shedding of a human life, a willing offering, of that individual, of himself, the blood of that individual being the Son of God in human form shows how much more uh, superior the uh, the latter is to, to the former. And um, so uh, by using those words, however, we do uh, have the, the uh, testimony that that blood is important and that we do indeed have a type going for us here. Normally what we do in that opening paragraph of each of these lessons, we say type is spoken, you know, right to us, <clears throat> no doubt, uses the word type, uses the word shadow, uses the word figure or something of this sort. Other times we're left to draw those conclusions ourselves by the depth and breadth of the comparisons that are made. This one, I think, is, is pretty pretty pure uh, and, and pretty obvious. So, our blood is extremely important to us, and that's, a, that's an understatement. Um, it delivers nutrients to our bodies, uh, our blood, blood cells, our carbon dioxide and other waste products to our lungs and kidneys and digestive system. 
It fights infection for us. It brings nourishment to the walls of our muscles. Uh, it regulates our body temperature. It sends hormones to needed areas. And obviously we can't live without, uh, without our blood. Blood is extremely important to us. And there is probably a lot of things, there are probably a lot of things that we don't even know that blood does for us. So when God created us and infused uh, into uh, mankind this life-giving fluid um, that he cannot, without which he cannot live, um, he, was, he, was, he was setting it up so that that blood would be an important piece of who we are and what we are and then tie that back into those Old Testament sacrifices of the animal sacrifices and the offering of their blood. As you said, Leviticus 17, 11 said, life is in the blood. Let me read also this online source um, that I found about blood. It says, blood is the life of the body. It has been recognized as the embodiment of life from antiquity. The blood carries the breath of life to every living part of our bodies as it binds the needed oxygen to its hemoglobin and distributes it to every cell. The liquid fibrous substance we know as blood is in essence the substance of our life. The properties of the blood extend beyond what even modern science uh, can comprehend. So, um, in an extreme understatement, blood is important um, to us physically in this life and very important to God in the carrying out of his will for man and how he has set it up in his, we call it a plan of redemption or a scheme. Scheme sounds a little shady, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but it's referred to as a scheme of redemption. God, the way God has set it up that man can free himself from his sins is blood is in there. And it's been in there for a long time. And uh, so God places an extremely important uh, value on, on blood and uh, refers to it uh, numerous times in the scriptures. Do you want to say anything as part of introduction? I think it's pretty well covered. Okay. So this connection uh, between God and sin. Uh, sin, uh, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, comes from a Greek word, hemarsha. I think, a hamartia, or however that's pronounced. I always heard it, a marcia, probably an anglicized uh, pronunciation of it, uh, means to go beyond the limits. And it is referred to as when an uh, archer would shoot an arrow and miss the mark, go beyond the mark. That's what sin is. Sin is hitting the mark. Sin is um, attaching oneself to the goal, and the goal is not to sin. When we sin, we go beyond God's uh, goal for us, and it's transgress, go beyond um, the law. Um, fuller definition or application of Scripture suggests that it is an act of obedience to divine law. That's from Vine's Expository Dictionary. So uh, sin is... Is when we don't comply with what God expects of us, what he has laid down for us as his law. The Bible takes uh, great pains uh, to go into detail um, on this, this next part that, that we talk about here. God created mankind and gave him the freedom and the restrictions of the garden. And it's always, I've always found it interesting that God gives Adam and Eve so much freedom. Do anything you want. Name the animals. Take care of the garden. You know, whatever you want. Just one thing. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden. One rule. One forbiddance. Out of all the things that they could do. And... That one they broke. Uh, we're all familiar uh, with that story. Uh, but he said, do not eat of the tree of knowledge. He expects people to lay down, to follow the rules that he has laid down for them. 
Adam and Eve, along with every other human being that's ever lived except Jesus of Nazareth, has failed in that regard. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I wasn't talking about all of the people there in that building or that country or that time area. He was talking about all. All um, all, all have fallen short of the glory of God and sin. And it seems, and this is the point that I was talking about, the Bible takes pains and almost goes out of its way to show us the humanity of man, that none of us is perfect. Noah was not perfect. Adam and Eve were not perfect. Abraham was not perfect. Moses was not perfect. Um... The only one that even comes close, I think, was Enoch. And we yeah. simply don't have enough. Yeah. It says he walked with God and God took him. Okay? Um, but all of these, several of these other people were, walked with God as well. And we have the passage that says, all have sinned. Romans 3.23, right there it is. Um, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So, um, uh, God knows that man will sin, and he has provided a way for man to get forgiveness of his sins. The other thing uh, about this is that God is faithful uh, to his promises. Um, Numbers 23.19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. He has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Those rhetorical questions, the answers are, of course he will. He will not lie, and if he has said something, if he's promised something, he will follow through with it. God, by his very nature, cannot lie. Hebrews 6, 17 and 18 says, In the same way, God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have a strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. So God says things. He will comply with what he says he will do because he cannot lie. And so when we try to uh, make excuses or hold out false hope, or reinvent the scriptures to say something other than the fact that God will reward and God will punish. When we mess with that, we're messing with this passage that says, God is both. He is just and he is righteous. And those two are not against one another. And it does mean that there is going to be a judgment and he will come through with what he says and what he has promised for those who are not his. Depart from me, I never knew you. And those are going to be horrible, horrible words for uh, a bunch of people uh, to hear. God makes covenants with man, as we have said. Um, We've noted that a covenant is an agreement imposed upon both sides and both sides agree to keep on their half, to keep their half of the deal. God says, follow me, keep my rules, I'll bless, reward you, disobey me and break my rules, I will punish you. Uh, this was true under any covenant observed by man and in, in the Old Testament is certainly true under the new covenant uh, established by Christ according to what we just read uh, in Hebrews 9 and 10 for sure. So. God makes covenants with man. With punishments and broken rules, and when man breaks those rules, God cannot lie, he cannot break an oath. Man is guilty of sin for which God must account. If he's going to be true to who he is, and he will be, man transgresses God's law, and atonement must be made if man is to be reconciled back to his God. So, God and sin are, are two major themes of the Bible. Um, what God has done for mankind 
what mankind has done in return um, to God and for God in rendering obedience or in um, disobedience on, on either on either side. And this notion that uh, that he has has infused into speaking of uh, blood being infused, he has infused that into the conversation and into the situation through. The Old Testament sacrifices, blood sacrifices, and in the New Testament, the blood sacrifices of Christ. God hates sin. God despises sin. You know how I know God hates sin? The Bible tells us that God hates sin. Um, in Proverbs 6, uh, it lists six types of sin that God hates there, Proverbs 6, 16 to 19. Um, and, and it specifies them, a lying tongue, a haughty... Haughty um, look, hands that shed innocent blood. Hands that shed innocent blood, just six six of those that that he says. And I don't know why, I haven't, I haven't gone back and recently to say, you know, well, why does he only specify six? I think we could generalize and say, not only those, God hates all sin. Sin means going beyond God's expectation for us. And he can't just uh, treat it casually. He can't just uh, dislike it. Sin needs to be abhorrent to him. <coughs> he cannot, cannot bend on that. And so the implication is neither can we. When we attempt to water down justify um, in some way pass off what is forbidden in scripture as something that's not applicable in today's world um, mankind has changed society is different um, whatever justification you want to offer for saying that God's will delivered to us once for all mankind needs to be modified, justified, reinterpreted in current light. I'm not going to do that because I don't want to face God in judgment and say, you know that passage you said that was a sin? That's really not a sin. You know, things were different in our time. We had, we had grown, and we had matured, we had accepted that. I'm, I'm not going to be the one to tell God that, that we changed his word. And so um, when God says it, it is what it says. It's what he means. And it is a sin in his eyes when it was written, and it's a sin in his eyes now. God, Jesus, is the same today tomorrow and forever. God is the same today, tomorrow, uh, and forever. So God is not going to change his attitude. God hates all sin. And so uh, for us to say otherwise um, is... Uh, okay, heresy. It's, it's not what the Bible teaches. Okay? There are some sins that um, we might classify as mm, little sins. White lies, sometimes we say, you know, white lies. Or uh, just a little, uh, little sin here and there. I don't commit the big ones, so uh, I'm okay. Um, are you willing to face God on the day of judgment and say, you know, we took up on it ourselves to classify uh, the sins uh, that mankind ha has committed. And, and some of these are really bad ones, and some of these are kind of bad ones. And some of these we really didn't mess with because uh, we didn't think they were as important as you did. I don't want to tell God that on the Day of Judgment. There is an, another piece to this, and I, I, it's not in the lesson, but I wrote it out here in the margin, this idea that um, God um, tells us, thou shalt not. It says here in the law of Moses, uh, the, the law was full of sins that people were warned against. 
uh, of committing. Some say that there were 613 different laws with 35, 365 of them, over half of them being don't do this, forbidding them to do something. So when they did do that, they were committing sins. Uh, they were going beyond what he told them to with that, uh, with that notion of overshooting the, the target there. On the other hand, there were things that he told them to do, instructions that they had, certainly under the old law, numerous, numerous details about how they were to construct the tabernacle, how they were supposed to conduct sacrifices, uh, what they were supposed to do with the blood, what they were supposed to do with this and that and this and that. Um, it seems as though God made the old law so difficult, so onerous, so impossible to keep perfectly that he knew man would fall short in that regard. And the old law, as we have said, was not designed as that which was going to save man, especially since he could not keep it. And those passages are in there. It was not in man to be able to keep the old law perfectly. And so there was the need for that Savior, that one who would come and atone for all of those who had sins that they could not account for, could not keep, and only had a remembrance of, for him to come and offer himself and die on the cross and then uh, allow those people to have forgiveness of their sins. So, don't do this. They did it. They committed sin. Do this. They didn't do it. Well, how can I do something if I don't? How can I be guilty of committing something if I didn't actually do something? I just didn't do it. So we talk about the sins of commission, committing sins, and those sins that we commit by omitting doing God's will, not doing God's will. So there are those two types of sins, the ones where he says, thou shalt not, and we have those in the, in the New Testament as well, not only under the old law. And he has others in there that we are told that we should do or must do. And if we don't do those, we are just as guilty of sin as if we had gone against his word and done something that he told us not to. Would you like to offer anything? Yeah. <clears throat> You don't think God cares very much about whether or not you follow his rules. You haven't read through Leviticus yet. It seems, seems pretty clear, you know. True. He, he lays out an entire book on how to follow his laws in the Old Testament. Very specific, um, like you say, very arduous uh, to keep. But uh, he's very specific about these things. Extremely. Um, yeah, so I mean, he cares. Uh, and essentially, he's drawn a line in the sand. Do this, don't do this. Uh, and if you do this, you're pleasing to me. If you don't do this, you're not pleasing to me. So, obviously, we live our lives trying to be pleasing. And uh, we have mentioned this before, but I'll repeat it and repeat it here. When, when God established his covenant um, with the Israelites, and when he gave them the law and gave them all of these rules that they had to follow and that and uh, Aaron was the, the chief priest and, and the Levites were those who tended the tabernacle and, and had to carry out all these sacrifices and, and the caring for the, the elements within the tabernacle and all of these things. Um, within the next chapter, I don't know how long it was after God closed his session with Moses and said, okay, now you have the law, go do it. It was within the next two chapters that two of, of uh, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, didn't follow instructions. Don't know the nature of what they did. It just says that they offered strange fire. It wasn't what God authorized. And I don't know whether it was in like with uh, Cain, an attitude problem, or whether it was the substance or, or how they did it, the process. Whatever it was, it wasn't what God uh, required 
of them and had specified in great detail. They took it upon themselves to change what God had said to do. God strikes them dead. Not only does he strike them dead, he forbids Aaron and his family to mourn for them. God was sending an extremely strong signal. These two individuals gave him the opportunity to tell Moses and all of the nation of Israel, I mean what I say. Do what I say. Don't take it upon yourself to change my law. We talk also about and it just didn't occur to me until um, probably within the last two to three years. Um, Day of Pentecost, the establishment of the church, Christ's covenant with man from the time that he rose from the dead and going through those, those next 50, 40 days or so, 47 days, whatever that many days there were there, before the church was established in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, um, God set up his new covenant with man. All of Jesus' teachings were new and novel and different. That's why the Jews hated him. That's why they wanted to get rid of him. He was bringing about a new order, a new way of thinking very different from uh, the old law, or at least what the old law had become to the leading uh, Jews at that time. And so things are happening around Jerusalem. Thousands of people are being saved and being added to the church. Uh, people are, are taking folks in and, and sharing unbelievably, having all things in common, um, a brotherhood, a new uh, revival is going on, what it must have been like in Jerusalem during those days and shortly thereafter. People were selling property and bringing all the proceeds that they had and laying it at the apostles' feet and say, distribute this to those who are in need or those who are living here because they've come from afar. We need to love one another enough in order to do that. Ananias and Sapphira sell a piece of property. Very noble of them. They bring the proceeds to the feet of the apostles. But not all of the proceeds from that sale. They want it to look like they are doing so. They want to deceive the apostles and those around to make them think that they, Ananias and Sapphira, are as noble and good and sacrificing as much as everyone else. But they are stricken dead, just like Nadab and Abihu. Here, at the advent, the initiation of God's new covenant, based on the sacrifice and blood of the son that he sent to this earth to die, people were trying to deceive. And that may have been a part of Nadab and Abihu's situation. Maybe they were trying to strange because they were trying to deceive. I don't know. Seems to me a man, a human being, that that was a little strong. <laughs> killing Ananias. And then when Sapphira comes in later, killing her on the spot. I think what he was doing was sending another message. This is my law. This is the way I want people to behave. I want people to render obedience. And I want people to be pure when they come to me with what they offer to me or my causes. And he took that step of saying, your sin is great enough that you need to die. And so those two individuals died. Um, Acts, the fifth chapter, I believe, uh, is the account there. And you can go uh, read it for yourself um, if you need that review. Um, so God is serious about sin. He's serious about the sacrifices 
under the old law and the, the uh, details of that old law. And he's just as serious about how he has set up his new law. And he wants to um, make sure that man does everything he can to comply with it. He understands that we're going to fall short. He is extremely sympathetic. He is extremely patient. He is extremely long-suffering. He is extremely forgiving, as he demonstrated to us with the Israelites over and over and over again under the old law. And those are for our learning. Those situations are to be our schoolmaster, our instructor, as examples to us. And those are all terms that are used in various passages in the Bible. God loves us. God wants us to be saved. He sent his son to die on this earth, take on the sins of all mankind. So God wants us to be saved. He wants us to be successful. He wants us to hit the mark. And God, and, and God wants man to hate sin as much as he does. If man hates sin, then theoretically he will do less of it <coughs> because it displeases God. He wants to be pleasing to God, so he will do less of it. In Romans the seventh chapter, Paul goes into what seems like a you know a more extended explanation or discussion of the struggles within himself, um, verse fourteen to twenty five there where he talks about, uh, and this is Paul, we're not talking about um, <clears throat> Joe Sinner. We're talking about Paul, the individual that God has set aside to be his spokesperson, his apostle born out of due time, his um, message bearer to the Gentile nation um, with his multiple journeys that he took and establishing churches that he did and um, uh, all of the bruises and and stripes and suffering that he went through on behalf of God we think this man must have been an icon of purity but listen to what he says there in Romans 7 well, let's just read part of that there all of us, I think, are familiar with it, but if we're not, this is the conflict that goes on in between a man who, in inside of a man, who is doing his absolute best to be pleasing to God. And yet he is, I think, more honest with himself than I am with, with, with myself about the struggle that goes on with inside of him. Romans 7 verse 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh sold into bondage to sin. For that which I am doing, I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing that I hate. And I don't know what Paul's issues were. I don't know what his problems were, and maybe he had a lot more problems than I know about. Apparently, he feels like he did. But if I do the very thing I do not wish to do, I agree with the law confessing that it is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which indwells me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the wishing is present in me, but the doing of good is not. For the good that I wish, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not wish. For if I am doing the very thing I do not wish, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wishes to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man 
that I am. Who will set me free from the body of this death? And that's that's Paul. That's my hero. <laughs> right. That's my guy that 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 gives me something to look up to in a human other than Christ as a role model. Paul says, what you see in me, imitate as often as I imitate that which is in Christ. And so Paul was either just really down when he wrote that or had just committed a big sin when he wrote that or, or whatever his situation was. Or maybe he was just cognizant of the fact that we as humans are flawed. We all sin. Even when we don't know we sin, we sin sometimes. And maybe that's part of our problem that we don't feel more often the way Paul did at he, that time. He's writing a treatise on, on justification here in Romans, you know. Absolutely. And we talk about justification a lot, but it's kind of a big Christianese word. But it's a simple way to think about it is just as if I'd never sinned. Uh, and Paul's focused on that. I mean, laser focused throughout the book of Romans. He's working us through how to get reconciled back, become friends again with God, be justified again. And you kind of see some of his frustration come out here in, in chapter 7, toward the last part here that you just read. And he's like, this sin, I, I don't want to do it, but I keep going back to it. I can't, don't seem to be able to get away from it far enough that it'll leave me alone. He's, you kind of see him pounding the table. Yeah. This stupid sin. Yeah. <laughs> Me, me, alone. right? <laughs> yeah. uh, and it's this tension that is inherent in man between uh, wanting to satisfy self and wanting to satisfy God, and and that's what we're talking about here. Sin is, and uh, someone once said that every sin can be related back to, in some way, pride or ego. It's what I want to do rather than wanting to do what God wants me to do. And so there is more emphasis on self than on self-denial and and wanting to do and doing what God uh, wants us to do. And I drew a little uh, graph or chart over here uh, in my margin. And I, and I said the, the life cycle of a Christian, the life cycle of a Christian um, ought to look something like this. As we mature, the day that we're baptized, if our, if, our, if our conversion was sincere, we were extremely sorrowful and horrified that our sins sent Christ to the cross and that he died for me, for my sins. And that was, it should have been, at least in some way, a, a transforming uh, event in our lives. That from that day forward, we were dedicating ourselves to doing everything we could to become more Christ-like. That as we matured as Christians, as we studied his word more as Christians and followers of his, as we practiced greater self-denial and conformed our will to his will, we would become more like him. And as a result, we would sin less. So if we have a chart, a graph like this, and we have our maturity going in this direction, our love of Christ, our conforming ourselves to his will, going in that direction, we have another line over here which ought to be opposite that and going in the other direction, that we sin less and less. So we've got our growth as a Christian, our maturing as a Christian, our conforming our lives, to God's will as a Christian, heading in an upward ray, and we have, theoretically, 
the amount of sin or the types of sin, the number of sins, how easy it is for us to sin, whatever, however you classify that, going in the other direction. I am sure that Paul's upward path was not a direct, was not a parallel line with his sins. I cannot imagine Paul not changing considerably from his conversion on the road to Damascus and his ultimate conversion to the gospel of Christ, not impacting his behavior in a way to realize, and, and he talks about this throughout his letters about how people, how many people depended on him as a figure, as, a, as the apostle of Christ to be who he was to adhere to what God wanted him to do. Even in prison, he was converting people. Um, he was praying for the people out amongst the churches. And not only all of the physical problems that he uh, underwent on behalf of Christ, but he had that pressure, that constant pressure of all the churches as well. His maturity level had to be off the charts, if you ask me. And... It, it just blows my mind that, that he was sensitive enough to whatever sins he had in his life, that it was still a struggle for him to even get rid of those which remained. And like I said, he could have had a lot more problems than, than he lets on. But that right there tells you that I think, and I, I could be wrong, but it makes sense to me that the more you mature, the less temptation there is to sin. There are things in, in my life, at my age now, that in earlier times, in earlier circumstances, in earlier situations, would have been extremely strong temptations to which many I gave in to. Wouldn't even be a problem for me now. And I'm not holding myself up as any, any special kind of icon. It's just that I have lived a long time. I, I believe in God's word. I attempt to conform myself to his expectations. And so as a result, many of the things that tempted me in the past, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even bat an eye if they would present themselves to me at this point in my life. I'm hoping that that suggests that I am reaching a maturity level where I sin less and less. Now it could be that I've just adopted new sins, <laughs> and I still and I still have just as many. Um, but I'm thinking that when 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 we are told in Hebrews the sixth uh, chapter verse one, press on to maturity. Maturity for what outcome? Well, maturity so that we can be more complete, that we can sin less that we can be more like Christ. Uh, Philippians 3, Paul says he presses toward that goal. Romans 12, 2 tells us to be not conformed to this world, but be transformed, be changed, so that you can pursue more of what God expects of us. And Hebrews 4, 13 tells us to try to become a perfect man filled with Christ or mature man. So what does that mean? If it doesn't mean attempting to sin less, which will make us more Christ-like, I don't know what that is. And I don't know why they would tell us to do it, to be that, to strive for that, if it weren't possible. Next week, we'll talk about the prominence of blood in Old Testament scripture. We have alluded to that in a few cases um, up to this point. And then we'll talk about blood and sin under the old law. That will take us through an examination, I believe, or pretty close to through examination of the importance of blood um, under the old law and how we have applied that in some ways so far to us under the new law. So we're out of time. Thank you guys for joining us today. Yeah, I know several people said you were having problems with the audio today for whatever reason. Uh, I'll turn it up as loud as it'll go on YouTube. So if you missed something today, uh, you can rewatch the this class on YouTube and maybe hear. Um, 
Every I can, word. I can <laughs> clip this to my lip. There you go. Clip it to your nose. <laughs> um, I don't think so. <laughs> All right, guys. We'll see you Sunday, hopefully. Bye. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>